Tēnā koutou katoa. It's amazing how time keeps flying by, currently only 15 days until the first day of spring. But this evening we have our own reason to celebrate, as we are joined by the lovely Ben Harris. <laughs> ben has been a medical microbiology scientist for a few years now, having registered in 1978, including microbiome and its relationship to health and disease, emerging antibiotic resistances, and emerging infectious diseases. Tonight's webinar is titled Skin Infections, Infections, Parasites, and Rashes. I sense Ben is going to have a few of us itching and scratching along the way. <laughs> and I'll now hand you over to Ben, thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy and Pauline and to Mobile Health for, for um, sponsoring all this and arranging it. Uh, you're making me itchy already, Cathy, and I don't I keep the itchy parts till the end. But thank you for all those listening in. Please do send um, questions ongoing. And Cathy, she's got authorization for two things. One is to interrupt me at any time, so <laughs> she's not being rude. And if she gives me about five or seven minutes before the end, I don't mind what that time is, but five to seven minutes, then I can tie some things up if need be. So primarily skin and soft tissue infections tonight. And it covers lots of things, but it's in some ways it's a good one. You can't see COVID, but you can see skin and soft tissue infections. So um, one, it's nice to have a breather from COVID, but um, two, if I can get this going, uh, we'll try that again. Here we are. I give the summary for a start for um, skin and soft tissue. There's three key points. Number one is the appearance. And if we know the appearance, that really helps a lot. So vesicles are these little things with fluid in them. And a vesicle with pus in it is a pustule. And then we have nodules or papules, which are raised above the skin, but they're, they're firm. There's no fluid in them at all. They're firm. And the papules or nodules. Then we can have macules, which is just discolorated, uh, skin with a discoloration, but quite flat. And then we can have scales, so scaly skin. And then it's important to know what the edge of the rash is like. Can you see an edge or is there no edge at all? All those things, when you look up a textbook, they're all really useful to have to help categorize things for a start. Then there's the location, not only the body site, but is it on both sides or is it unilateral? So we know um, that shingles is going to be unilateral, for instance, and chickenpox is going to be all over. So unilateral or symmetrical. And then within location, there's also the physical location. What country is it? You're unlikely to see anyone coming in with rabies if they've never been overseas. So we know rabies is only overseas. And um, tick bites of, of concern, when are you going to get overseas? Then the city and region. So we know that, um, well, uh, we know that MRSA, for instance, in the Auckland region is around 13% of all Staphylococcus aureus that grow, whereas in the South Island, it's about 5% of all Staph aureus that grow. And then within the healthcare facility, uh, some use a lot more antibiotics than others whether it's rest homes or hospitals or other. And so they may have an outbreak, current problem with a very resistant bacteria, whatever it may be. So bear those in mind. Then the ex there's expression, the host is critical for the success of the party. The party success, of course, is the microbes um, when they sing and dance because they've managed to break through our defenses. And that can depend on age. So a child is going to have a different reason for a rash than an adult, generally. The vaccination status, if they haven't been vaccinated for measles, then they're more likely to have it. Um, suddenly, the history, is it something that keeps recurring with staph Staphylococcus aureus, uh, boils and such like? What's their circulation like, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, are they on chemotherapy? Have they got an immune system deficiency? and diet and ethnicity. Ethnicity can tie in with them. Um, seldom is ethnicity, seldom is um, your genetics responsible. It can be in some things, but seldom is your genetics responsible. It's normally to do with socioeconomic um, issues. Uh, 
Now, if I can get this going again, I move my cursor over here and onwards. It's going to go. I'll try again. Here we are. So, clinical, of course, down the left includes folliculitis, cellulitis, boils, bites, ulcers, rashes. For the actual causes, maybe bacteria, staph, and I'm just going to mention another point staph aureus, for instance, MRSA. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus and methicillin susceptible Staph aureus, on average, they are both just as aggressive. MRSA is no more aggressive on average than fully susceptible Staph aureus. We tend to see it more in chronic infections because chronic infections, people have been on more and more antibiotics and selected for any resistance that's there. Sometimes we can have an outbreak, for instance, of boils with fully susceptible Staph aureus, and sometimes we can have an outbreak with MRSA. Apatago, cellulitis, virus can be shingles, warts, herpes, et cetera, uh, which includes um, shingles, of course, fungi, candida yeast, athlete's foot, tinea, and the parasites, lice and scabies and such like. Okay, doc. Then, as I think I've already covered off, we can have um, uh, a unilateral tender uh, rash on one side that doesn't go beyond halfway and we may be thinking it shingles uh, on a back or elsewhere. An unvaccinated child, uh, the rash is, is more likely to be one of the childhood rashes. Uh, bed sores, cellulitis can be anywhere. Cellulitis tends to be unilateral. Uh, Post-op wound infections, bites, is it a dog bite, is it a cat bite, that tends to be on the arms. Uh, or fingers, hands, and depending where the bite is, there may be lower blood supply, which makes us more predisposed to infection, and cellulitis and such like can be anywhere. Um, so when we look at the skin, we have the hairs coming out of the skin there, and there's always um, uh, microbes, 10,000 or so at least, depending which studies you look at, it may be 10 times that per square centimeter and they can grow down the, the hair shaft a bit. But sometimes when they're down the hair shaft, then they can start multiplying and start causing, um, uh, start causing trouble. And that can be in stages, folliculitis at the base of a hair shaft. So folliculitis where we get inflammation around the base of a hair shaft. So the staph or at staphylococcus aureus at the base of a hair shaft. If somebody shaves their legs, we may see where the hair shaft was and effectively the epilation, the pulling out of the um, hair shaft can be where the Staphylococcus aureus, which is normally present on the skin, can be where the Staphylococcus aureus um, starts causing uh, trouble. Um, and then, so that's a closer up view of it also. That's a pustule, of course, the pus inside a, a vesicle, if you like, at the base of a hair shaft. So it's a question of degree. When that pustule gets worse, then it goes from superficial folliculitis, just very lightly, to worse as folliculitis, as the um, uh, pustule. Furuncle is worse still, the infection coming down, and many furuncles are carbuncles, so they can get worse still. So it's just a question of degree rather than. Um, uh, I'm having trouble changing these over to the next slide. There we are. And so this is impetigo, uh, which we'll all be familiar with, a good dose of impetigo. And then it can get worse, and we can have boils, which become carbuncles, uh, good, juicy carbuncles full of Staphylococcus aureus. What does one treat uh, with a cutaneous abscess? So if somebody turns up, what, what do you do? Uh, with it. Well, there's often the surveys done in the States uh, comparing emergency medicine pro provider practice patterns, what they do with cutaneous abscesses. And this one here, I've, I've used, there's 350 replies from mainly university teaching hospitals, so we hope they do really good practice, and about half of them were physicians and 78% 70, were university teaching hospitals, but half of them were physicians. And when we look at what they do, 
half of them used no irrigation and half of them did. The literature actually is out on that and shows the textbooks tend to either not mention it at all to play safe. Irrigation seems to make sense because you're getting rid of all those bugs, but it may not. With Zen, the incision itself is worth very worthwhile to uh, do the incision. The irrigant that's used tends to be saline, uh, mainly saline. Um, then what instructions are the patients given? 15% uh, of people said return in 24 hours. We'll look at it again, a third, two days, and almost half come in two days unless it gets worse. So they're just the standard instructions that may be given for a cutaneous abscess. Do you culture your abscess? Do you culture it or not? And um, it's good to know what you're treating, but it can cost a fortune when we aggregate it across the country. And so 68% said no, not routinely, but notice the learning pattern we go through. The more experienced we get, as in the physicians, the um, more confident we become in our processes. So only 28% said no, there's no need to vaccinate it. Save that 70% of money. And whereas the mid-level providers who are less experienced, don't worried about being sued and all the rest. Remember, this is the States, uh, maybe sued and all the rest. They say, yes, go ahead. So almost 90% of them do culture it. It's going to be staph aureus, and you're going to know the antibiotic patterns in your particular area. Um, then this was the interesting one. Would you cover with antibiotics? Would you give a covering treatment with antibiotics? And only 15% said yes to routine antibiotic use. Now, a few years ago, half to 80% said yes. So we hope out here, it is the minority of times that it's happening that people are being um, are using antibiotics to cover it. 58% uh, said yes to antibiotics if the patient is diabetic or immunocompromised, and that makes good sense. Caught a yes, MRSA, but remembering what I said, MRSA is no more aggressive than MSSA on average. Three quarters quite rightly said yes, if there's a surrounding cellulitis, so long as it was cellulitis, and 99% allowed wounds to, to heal secondary intention of their own accord. Look at the difference. Physicians experienced 15% said yes to antibiotics, but we know new prescribers are twice as likely at least to use antibiotics. Oh, I know this will work. I know it'll help. I know that bacteria is likely to be susceptible, but we should be very, very mindful of that gap. We, there's no need the majority of the time. And there, there were the other, other ones um, that I mentioned before. Um, this I just put in today. Um, Differentiating cellulitis from subcutaneous abscess inflammation. So here we have that pustule and with inflammation around it, no clearly demarked zone, whereas a cellulitis is, tends to be deeper, tends to be deeper and not such a clear zone. Um, uh, erythema, there will be not, not a clear, clear zone. It's deeper and not so clear. And that'll be very, very tender around here. If it's still growing, keeps growing, of course, there's trouble as well. So that's all I'm going to say on that at the moment. Next, ask yourselves, what is causing this? What's causing this? And I just throw it in. And you can have a little bit of a think. There's are these little pustules all over starting to grow, uh, starting to emerge. And here's a closer up one of, of them. And it is, um, unfortunately, I can't hear what you're saying, but I know 99% of it would have, you would have said, ah, that's sparple dermatitis, isn't it? So they've become large numbers of pseudomonas growing in a sparple, and eventually it's overcome our immune system on the skin flora with all our microbiome there. It's overcome it and started forming little pustules. So cleaning up the sparple and treating it properly will do it. These will generally come right of their own accord without any antibiotics but sometimes may need an antibiotic, but because it's pseudomonas, it's quite a heavy one, although you may get away with topical antisepsis. So I just wanted to put that in. These are things that do happen. Bed sores. This one, 
It's a repulsive bed sore, and in actual fact, I have to um, tell you, I got it some years ago off, off the internet from not a medical site, a legal site, a legal firm in the States, where, of course, you can sue. And if any one of your residents, any one of your family has even the tiniest sore, let us know, we can make you a lot of money, was the advertisement that went with it. So you can see how... Um, this sewing can make people's procedures get better than they may have been otherwise <laughs> if I'm doing so. So on the left and the right, two different types of ulcers. Um, on the left is, I'm sure you'll know, as compared to the right, I just pause for a while while you think about it. On the left, we have a venous ulcer. They can be different sizes, including quite large. They have an irregular edge. Um, they are quite moist. Um, generally quite moist. This one is not infected, it's quite moist. Um, whereas the arterial ulcer tends to be smaller and even edged and cold. And unless it's infected, it's quite dry on the bottom. And we have a hint of the um, blood supply because we've got the nail hair also that's not um, forming properly because of the lack of blood supply. And if I come over here again. I'm having trouble with this. I'm trying to get the right place. Here we are. And so I just wanted to mention those. Neither of those are infected. And sometimes they can get a bit crusty, the venous ulcer, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's infected at all. And there's no cellulitis to speak of there. This, of course, you'll know. Um, it's not a clearly demarked edge, um, but it's a, we can see it. Um, increasing the cellulite is increasing and we look at that every hour or two and if that line gets bigger and bigger we know it's deep seated it'll be painful it'll be hot um, and there's another one of it so actually not a really clearly defined edge when we um, when we look at the edge here is a little bit diffuse to see just exactly where it is or over here the edge is not totally defined along the along the way um, What's the source, likely the source of this, which is, tends to be either a Staph aureus or a Streptococcus, and it can seldom be grown. But the source of it is likely to be, uh, when it's on a leg, remember it's likely to be unilateral, but it's likely to be from the tinea between the toes, often the little toe and the second toe, or the next one long rather for, and um, it's often a maceration, uh, with dampness. Tinea is like soap because it's alkaline. So we do have a problem when someone has a bit of tinea, they tend to push more soap into it to try and clean it up. And that's what the tinea is really love. So stop using soap at all between the toes if tinea is a problem. And with the wet maceration, the normal skin flow, which may be Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus, grows to large numbers. And that's the entry point for the cellulitis. That becomes the, the entry point. Um, so just bearing that in mind, um, then so clear up any, any um, tinnitus there are on people, especially if they get recurrent cellulitis. So cellulitis, um, maybe with or without an abscess, is very common, uh, includes erysipelas, which is the red, really red ones, erythema, swelling, painful, et cetera, et cetera. There may or may not be systemic symptoms, including febrile and such like. Erysipelas are, the jury is out, should they be linked in with cellulitis or not? But in this case, um, uh, I have done a lot of it. Cellulitis is an expanding redness, expanding erythema, and as I said, often actually poorly demarcated. There is warmth or heat. It's quite tender, uh, really quite tender and there's swelling and or edema to go, to go with it. And they're the key points. I do a whole session on cellulitis, but there's no time tonight, but I thought I must slip it in. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to give Kathy a trouble trying to uh, <laughs> terminate. So, you know. Erysipelas, you can see on the yellow on the right, erysipelas are more surface. Then when the staph or strep is deeper, that is cellulitis. And when it's deeper still, including through to the bone, then we have necrotizing fasciitis and major trouble, uh, significant trouble with necrotizing. 
flesh eating disease, call it what you like, um, major trouble. So cellulitis is common in middle-aged and older adults. Um, remember, and um, remembering I said it tends to be uni uh, on one side only. Uh, erysipelas tend to be in young children and older adults, so those two distributions. And there's marked a five-fold increase in cellulitis in 54-year-olds upwards and over 85-year-olds. Uh, five-fold uh, increase, maybe 100 per 100,000 in the population. And they tend to come more in the warmer months, maybe because we get a higher number of Staph aureus between the toes, we're sweating more or strep, whatever it is that's causing it. Uh, the main causes are either strep or staph aureus, but we can seldom grow it, mainly perhaps only 15% of the time. We can't grow it, so we're, we're treating blindly on what may happen. Um, and once again, any site, most often, but not always a limb, unilateral, and it tends to be an indolent course of development, not as fast as you imagine, but when it goes faster. Of interest, I just must tell a story because stories are always useful. <laughs> About three years ago, I was um, in Switzerland with um, a very good friend, or staying with a very good friend from Switzerland, and we hadn't seen her for some years, and she used to live in New Zealand for five years. And she took us up, almighty climb up to a tarn in one of the mountains, so we had a swim there and freezing cold and I could discreetly see her ankle was looking somewhat red <laughs> and I thought oh, shall I say something shall I not I thought no 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 shut up Ben shut up <laughs> and it was summertime and that evening um, that rash had gone two-thirds the way up the leg and up to the knee I should say uh, so on the leg and I said, oh, this is about nine o'clock at night, I'm having dinner, and, and I saw it, saw it again. I said, oh, if I was you, Elizabeth, I'd, I'd get that seen too. And she said, oh, and this was Friday or something, she said, oh, the surgery's closed at the moment, they're um, reopening for refurbishments next Tuesday. I said, no, tonight. And she said, show you not. And I said, yeah, tonight, hospital, tonight. And... Um, she said, oh, no, I'll put it off. I said, no, definitely tonight. She said, would you come with me? I said, sure. So I went with her, went to the hospital. And the first person thought, um, uh, send your registrar, nothing too important. I said, could you get a second opinion, please? She was translating. <laughs> so I did. And the, the consultant came down and said, yes, definitely cellulitis. And my friend said, uh, what would have happened if I hadn't come tonight? She said, no trouble, but you wouldn't have a leg tomorrow. And it is going that fast. <laughs> she said, oh, you really mean it? And said, yes. And then we went to look. I already had looked carefully between the toes to see if there's any entry point there. And there's absolutely no entry point there, no tinea or anything at all. So I looked with a tooth comb to see if there could be any entry point at all. And there was what I felt was a little faint, faint entry point. And of course, being a Kiwi, and you're always a bit nervous about overseas countries and all of Europe. And so the con consultant went to look carefully between the toes and she said, I can't see anything. And I said, I'm just wondering, do you think it could be a tick bite? And when you look here, you'll see the faintest little hole. She said, my God, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I'm new to Europe <laughs> and um, there's so many tick infections here. And she said, yes, that would be a possibility. Should we do a blood test at the same time? to see if it's Lyme disease, and um, which we did. She was started on antibiotics that night, and a week later we got the results, it was Lyme disease as well, and um, saved the leg. So it's just, these things can happen very, very fast. Uh, it's just a nice little story. So there's something to think about, location. Um, I'm trying to get hold of this pointer again, which I'm having trouble with. Um, there we are. And, um, uh, so remember, if somebody had come from overseas and they had cellulitis, think of things like that. And rabies is another one to think of if that had a bite. So erysipelas, uh, generally acute symptom onset rather than the indolent of uh, cellulitis. Clear demarcation, unlike the cellulitis. And cellulitis, you know where it's up to, but it's not really sharp. And... Um, 
in systemic uh, symptoms often um, come ahead of local inflammatory response. So skin findings, there's pain, of cellulitis, pain, heat, redness, erythema, and swelling, and generally a relatively poorly demarcated uh, edge. First, uh, signs of systemic, feeling unwell, fever, chills, rigors. Um, I wasn't going to spend hardly any time on this, but <laughs> and then when it can flesh it, gas, green, severe sepsis, et cetera, et cetera. They're primarily a clinical domain. You find the staph virus between the toes or a strap there, but generally not. So you may get a, a raised white cell and raised CRP, but um, you'd be lucky if you go out in the blood cultures. Differential um, pseudocellulitis is often called, and it's often thought maybe cellulitis is incorrectly diagnosed over half the time, over half the time. So often people with venous eczema uh, may be localized infection, but it is not cellulitis. It can be a dreadful um, eczema, but, but it's not. And treatments, um, potentially serious cellulitis, um, mark the date and time. So if someone else is seeing them where the edge was of, uh, of their bouncing swelling, and be directed with your empirical treatment for staph virus and or strep by local patterns. As I said, 15% MRSA in the Auckland region, 5% in the South Island. Um, and can be at home if it's not too bad. Um, if it's not systemic, it can be at home, the treatment at least five days. Um, and so we have a, maybe starts off an abscess or other, it could have come from between the toes. You may get some blistering and start measuring how fast is that growing. And there's the necrotizing fasciitis. Ha can happen just overnight, very, very, very fast. Onwards, bites. So a cat bite, which is less common, maybe 10% um, of the bites, more common in children and more common in women, tends to be on the hands because often there is that women tend to be at home minding the children more than men do. And the teeth of the cat don't tear the skin so often. They are like a needle biting into the, it's an incisor that goes into the skin. So it's it's an inoculum. It, it goes deep and it goes in. So there's around a 50% chance of infection uh, from pastoral or other microbes from cat bites, 50% chance. Whereas dog bites may look far worse, but they hold and pull and tear. And so you're not getting a deeper inoculum uh, and that can be washed off much better. And that might only be 15 to 20, 10 to 20% chance of, um, of um, uh, getting infection. Uh, so dog bites are much more common, but much less lower chance of, um, of infection. Then we have human bites. Um, this is a fake um, slide, slide on the left, of course, um, but they, they can be either. They tend to be a penetration injury too. If someone bites and holds on, you can see the, the horseshoe shape of the teeth, fangs sinking in. And this shows my age, but Hollyford Tyson, and we've seen a more recent one, biting an air. Uh, these boxes, they have some revolting habits. And once again, that can be anaerobes, all the mouth flora causing it. So co-moxyclav, augment and call it what you will, can be more appropriate for those. I've often seen patients sent for query scabies or what's the cause of this. If you ever see uh, welts three in a row, start thinking that is consistent with something biting. Three in a row consistent with something biting because it's something purposeful. Nip, move a bit, nip, move a bit, nip. So that cuts out many, many things. It might be four or five long. Flea bites tend to be on the ankles and hands or arms where they've got access and or the belt line. So three or more in a row, think of something biting and you can rule out all these other things and you've got the hassle of hoovering or fly spray and all the rest. And you can put sheets or clothes into a freezer or into a hot dryer or you can wash them and there's all these other, other ways as well. But always be thinking that then, of course, you have to get rid of it from the primary source, which is likely to be an animal. Um, similarly, this here is, see, we see the linear 
they may have an allergic reaction to these elsewhere in the body. So they may have a rash, but anywhere with three or more welts in a row, and you can see a couple of lines there, um, and that fairly much defines something biting. This biting is a bed bug, not nearly as common as fleas, but getting more common. And when we open the borders again, they'll be more common again. And um, because often people bring them in in suitcases from overseas, New Zealanders returning and all the rest, but they're out here as well. They're, they're here too. And they're about the size of an apple seed. And when they've had a good feed like that one on the mattress, uh, often just on the edging on the mattress, then they're full of blood. And so they go from pale to a lot darker. And here the revolting critters are. And they, unlike a flea, which a flea you cannot squash unless you use your thumbnail, for instance, but these squash very, very easily. The bed bugs come out at night, mainly. They don't like the light. So if someone's got bites, maybe they've traveled or something or been to a motel or hotel, you can suggest uh, they try and have a pee between one and three o'clock at night <laughs> and uh, pull back the sheets and just have a look and see if there are any moving apple seeds <laughs> on the white sheets or not. And or if you've rolled over during the night, there might be some blood specks on the sheets because they are very fragile, unlike a flea and quite hard to get rid of. They can be resistant to various um, treatments too. Um, the relative sizes, here we have scabies just at the end of a line there, uh, under the skin, so they're tiny, about that little tiny black speck, about 0.3 of a millimeter. Uh, and you may almost imagine one just in front of the arrow there, and you can just see one around there. They're very hard to see <laughs> under the skin, but a flea um, is a lot bigger still. There's a comparative size. A flea, you would see it, especially in the neck hair of a dog, a tick, and bed bugs. Bed bugs about the size of an apple seed. Um, uh, what's going on? How do I get out of here? I come over to here. I've got to. Uh, Having trouble with this. I had it before. Here we are. This all right. Um, spider bites. Spider bites can cause, for a start, I said the initial one up, up the top above that spider, but they can cause something that looks just like a Staph aureus infection. I think you'd agree with a bit of erythema around it. And you swab it, expecting, because usually you usually don't see the spider, you swab it, expecting to find Staph aureus or maybe strep, and absolutely nothing grows. Yeah, well, that's funny. You try it again. And it can get worse and they can last a welt like that can last for six to nine months maybe eight ten percent of the time it will be infected but generally not and that's around the world and they've tried electron microscopy and everything else in case there's viruses there or something else it seems to be an immune response to the spider's venom and because we're in new zealand we're watery a lot of sea about i just mentioned uh, we can have eremonis, and there's a lot of other bugs too from uh, seawater and waterborne type infections. So that might be treated with a third generation Kiplosporin, for instance. Um, you all know what this is, um, I'm sure, I hope, <laughs> I'm sure. Here we have a nail where the cuticle, the quick, is attached to the nail, which means the water cannot get entry up into here and feed any bugs that are there. Whereas here, um, with the paronychia, it's where that cuticles come away from forming a seal. And uh, there's no seal there. So any water can get underneath and the normal skin flora, even if in tiny numbers, say a staph aureus or a strep, can get underneath and then start causing an infection. Um, so that's a... Um, um, a typical paronychia. The ideal is to keep that, if we have to wash our hands or when we have to, make sure the person takes particular care to dry with a paper towel or otherwise where the cuticles come apart because we want that to re-establish again. There's generally no point using a systemic antibiotic, antifungal or anti-staph aureus. Generally, often just a topical steroid can work really well at taking this away, but re-establishing the um, cuticle onto the nail is the key part. If somebody is, for instance, a dishwasher by profession, their hands are in water a lot. I know no, the same thing, but this is harder to do what I'm about to suggest now, as a dishwasher may have 
for instance, five or six sets of heavier duty gloves, which are cotton lined, so you don't sweat so quite so much on them. And once every hour or two, when your hand starts sweating, uh, you take the gloves off, turn them inside out, hang them up on a clip, and move on to the next one, move on to the next, and just do a slow rotation. They're not going to catch infection from the old one, just do a slow rotation so they can dry out in the meantime. And there's another paranoic here again coming through. So once again, generally a topical steroid will do it. If it got really bad, there may need to be an insertion and um, let the pus drain, but that's very much further down the line. Um, sometimes acute infections can do that. Here we have erythrasma. Um, I shouldn't have said it for a start, let you think about it. Erythrasma can tend to be on the, um, uh, in the flexures and such like. It looks a bit like a tinea, well, very like a tinea in many ways. And it's got a clearly defined edge, but it's actually caused by a bacteria called Carinibacterium minutissimum. I love the name, Carinibacterium minutissimum, but generally drying it up, some, if an antibiotic had to be used, something like erythro erythromycin can be used. Otherwise, quite often, just topical antisepsis and or drying it up can help. And it can be in the groins and such like. Ultraviolet light will give a, a bright um, red fluorescence. Here, I'll just keep quiet for a little while while you think about it. I think we have a classic case. Um, if I told you it was in a 90-year-old, I wouldn't be so sure. But if I told you it was in a child, I think you'd be thinking chicken pox, hopefully. And um, of course, the chicken pox, unlike COVID virus, dare I say, I don't like mentioning that name so much now, <laughs> and, uh, as we try and get away from it in a session like this. Um, Coronavirus or influenza or norovirus, we completely get rid of them uh, within a few days, sometimes a few weeks of getting over our infection. But the chickenpox virus, uh, we completely suppress it. We don't get rid of it. We suppress it to our nerve endings and we have no symptoms until at some stage later, um, it may pop back up as shingles when we um, when our immune system is getting low or we're getting older or well, sometimes I've had a, it took me a little while to think through it there's an office where um, and there about five people out of 15 got shingles surely it's infectious uh, they say and in fact no well theoretically it can be infectious you cannot catch shingles from somebody with shingles but if you'd never had chicken pox, or if you didn't have immunity to chicken pox, then yes, you could. If you touch those vesicles, for instance, then you could catch chicken pox from somebody with. So be aware of anybody who's pregnant dealing or considering pregnancy if they're dealing with, um, uh, with shingles, if they don't know they've had chicken pox or they're not immune. Just be aware of that. But you cannot catch shingles from somebody with shingles. Of course, it does not go past the midline at all when it's there. Now, I was going to say in an office, so if there's five people out of 15 came down with it, I had to think about that for a long time. And I think my best explanation is, and it's happened a couple of times, is I asked, was there colds or anything else going around? They said, yes. So often these other infections, including viral infections, can depress our immunity a wee bit. So if a number of people were just short of suppressing their chicken pox, at a time like that, it can pop up. So that's why you could get a cluster when there's a different infection going through. But it took me a long time. I've never seen it written, but it took me quite a while when I asked it to think through it. So there are these different rashes, and um, you're not going to be able to pick the differences uh, by just looking at them. There are some clinical differences. Rubella is relatively mild, and the non-pregnant is relatively mild. Measles, of course, is really bad. And... Um, has really significant adverse outcomes, including blindness, pneumonia, deaths, and such like. Just another one I threw in. This is um, effectively perhaps going up the lymphatics, but to think of, it looks quite nasty. It's a bacterial infection, not common, but I just mentioned it. Mycobacterium, there's hundreds, 600 or so different species of mycobacterium. It's a normal environmental bug. Some of them are pathogens. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, TB is TB, mycobacterium tub tuberculosis, which is TB. Uh, mycobacterium bovis is cattle TB, which can get into humans. Um, 
There are many different mycobacteriums. Four or five of them cause human infections. This one, Mycobacterium marinum, as the name suggests, can come, for instance, from fish tanks. And so people may be cleaning out a fish tank, and many people have fish tanks, cleaning out a fish tank, and it comes from that. Here's quite hard to treat, but antibiotics will treat it. Uh, just have a think on what you think that may be, and then I'll suggest what I think it is, because I happen to know. Um, but it's very typical, generally from the neck to the belt line, neck to the belt line. And it's got a number of names, uh, pityriasis or pityriasis versicola. Um, and it's caused by a yeast. And the yeast used to be called pityrosporum furfur and is generally called malassezia furfur now. Um, I just mentioned those names, but it tends to be called pityriasis. We have that yeast, or most of us have it, as part of our normal flora in low numbers. And sometimes, especially if we're getting a bit hot and sweaty, but some people, for whatever the reason, may be hormonal or other, um, starts growing. Fair-skinned people tend to get darker blotches. And this is why it's, it used to be called tinea versicola. Tinea versicola, different color, versicola, the opposite color to what your skin is. So a fair-skinned person will have darker blotches and a darker-skinned person will have fair blotches where it comes. And the old fashioned treatment uh, used to be Selsun shampoo, um, the gold, Selsun gold shampoo, which had selenium sulfide in it, and it still works as that happens. And so you could put that over from your neck to your, your waist for, and it's not gonna, well, hopefully it'll kill it if you use it for a week, you know, leave it on for 10 minutes, um, three times a week for a week leave it on for 10 minutes and wash it off thoroughly. It will kill it all, but it'll take um, six or eight weeks for the skin to come right again. And someone who's predisposed to it may know they're predisposed to it each summer. So I suggest these days um, you can use um, uh, peveril, foaming peveril um, um, to, um, to treat it, the shampoo, and that will treat it as well. That, that's an antibiotic, but so will selenium sulfate. Uh, quite distressing for people, it's only superficial. With these little pustules and papules, they can be hard to treat, looks like acne. And you may go ahead and treat it. And on, over on this slide here, there's a uh, Propionibacterium acnes, that's a bacteria, gram positive bacilli, that's a bacteria. There's a bacteria amongst white cells here in a gram stain. So Propionibacterium acnes can be treated either perhaps tetracycline or hydrogen peroxide, topically may get rid of it, but sometimes that won't work. And so one way is to take, get a scalpel blade, just take some of the pus out of some of these papules, put it on a glass slide, smear it on a glass side and send it to the laboratory to get them to do a gram stain. And if they see a yeast, then once again, it's the same yeast as causes that malassezia furfur or pitrosporum uh, or, or bacillari, same yeast. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. It's not common, but it's quite distressing when, when somebody has it. Uh, what am I doing? Yeah. And here is another condition. Note there's something eating away and sinking like an orange peel. This is um, called pitted keratolysis, pitting. You can see the pitting. The pitting is going inwards, not out. So people with boots on may get it, can get quite smelly, and people with boots on can get it. So taking the boots off when they're at home, take the socks off to dry it out as much as possible. Uh, fusitic acid may work, erythromycin may work, but in general, try and do these things with, with other methods and by drying the foot out as much as possible, changing the socks and such like. But pitted keratolysis is quite, quite common. Um, here's a, um, uh, just different rashes. And note the clearly defined edge. This is the arch typical, arch typical tinea or fungal infection, uh, arch typical a clearly defined edge, which you can scrape samples from, like a mushroom patch, quite okay skin more in the middle, and uh, because that's where it started and it's radiating out, so it's advancing at the edge. And um, so we just take the scrapings with skin scales and depending on the source, this is an animal source because it's a lot more angry. And when they come from an animal, they're a lot more angry 
Um, so this in a child will be thinking microsporum canis, coming from a cat or a dog. But when they're more subtle, we've generally caught them from between our toes. Um, in other words, they are um, um, the anthro, uh, anthropomorphic cause, because um, many people have tenure between the toes, and then they drive between their toes, they have the tail, they might um, drive their groin, so a few little spores may come up. The average sports show of somebody with tinea has something like 10,000 spores on it. <laughs> and so you can put the shows in the microwave. If you look behind you and nobody's watching, put it in the microwave or you can do various other things. You can pour hot water into it. Uh, in the microwave in a bag, I probably should say. So it doesn't, um, only takes 15, 20 seconds to kill all the spores. Um, or you can heat them somewhere if the shoes don't melt for about 70 degrees would, would kill them. Um, but um, uh, only a low chance. If we had a neck or a cut somewhere, uh, then that's when some of those spores, when we're drying ourselves, can start growing elsewhere on our body. Uh, but many tinnias or fungal infections are not what they seem. And um, so this is a, a tinnia, and you can see a reasonable edge there, but it's not nice clearing in the middle, but that is a tinnia. And I'm just going to rattle through some of these. That is an animal source tinnia because it's so angry. So it's a zoophilic. Uh, source. Um, what have I got here? Oh, yeah. uh, the fungi, I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with different terms. Uh, there's um, about um, yeasts, there are a few yeast, candida albicans, and cryptococcus is another one that you may or may not heard of. It's not a skin condition or rarely a skin condition. Tinea, uh, the tinnias, they're a uh, uh, trichophyton or microsporum or epidermophyton. We're not going to worry about that. Um, they, the laboratory does that. There's technically about 42 species, but there's three main ones, T. rubrum, M. canis, E. flicos, and won't worry about that. Molds, you breathe them every day. Uh, there's maybe 5 million species in the world, and you breathe, breathe in thousands every day, all day. But occasionally, some of them, and you'll recognize some of these names, Aspergillus penicillium, or you may well not have heard of Fusarium. Uh, some people can Aspergillus, most people we breathe that no trouble at all. If you've got an old TB cavity, it can loves it. It loves it because it's a nice, moist, warm environment for it to grow. And it grows on there, doesn't invade, but it produces spores and you can get asthma and allergic ongoing issues with that. But some people, for instance, with um, uh, leukemia, it can invade, but not necessarily leukemia, but some people can invade and, and cause um, significant trouble. Um, so here's another, this is a, um, another tinea. Here's another one again. I'm just going through, sorry, they're not as clear as they could be. But sometimes these tinnias can form big bulging area, and this is called a carrion, K-E-R-I-O-N, carrion. And it looks, well, there's some pustules there. They should grow something. And you can swab it. And it'll grow nothing at all because the fungi may well be producing antibiotics that won't even grow normal skin flora. Um, and it's a pure. I have one of these on a forehead of a um, of somebody many years ago from the west coast of the South Island. And the surgeon phoned me up, sent a picture, and this woman, she was in mid fifties, had a big one of these right in the forehead. And he said he sent sample to the lab and everything, and there's no growth at all. And he thinks it looks like a carcinoma. I said, he just phoned me up to ask my advice. And I said, oh, incidentally, on the West Coast, she doesn't happen to have contact with cows and milk cows, does she? And I said, what made you think that? And I said, well, I just wonder if she's leaning her head against a cow. <laughs> I said, it's a long shot. Leaning her head against the cow, she may have a cattle form of ringworm, if you like. Uh, uh, track apart and varicosum and that takes three to six weeks to grow it will not grow in ordinary culture so if you send me over some sample and i'll have a look at it so i did and sure enough it was this tinea he said i i could have sworn it was a a carcinoma um so just to be aware of some of these relatively unusual but they do happen here's another one again doesn't look like a tinea but it is it doesn't look like one but it is so be aware if your initial cultures don't grow and you're expecting them to. 
This one here, it's not this actual patient, but I saw a patient as it happened from the Chatham Islands, and they were like this from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And I thought this is a really bad allergy come eczema type of thing. It's got worse and worse. And the patient was sent over and they'd treated with stronger and stronger steroids. I took some sample, it was in fact a, um, a fungal infection. And so steroids with a fungus will either make it come down because it's anti-inflammatory, make it come down until you stop using it and it hasn't touched the fungus and it'll just go back to what it was. Or and that's what happened in this case, or the fungus will start feeding on the steroid and go berserk. And this person had it for a couple of years before they sent out sent over from the Chathams. Here we have another tenure. Note the clearly defined edge. Um, here, clearly defined edge, a lot lighter in the middle, and we get a clue here too because it's also an onychomycosis. So that's a, a lucky clue to um, get that as well for for a tenure. Okay. This looks perhaps like a burn, and it wasn't. It was a tinea. I just want to introduce you to this, um, to all these many different different forms. Then, um, when we have satellite submammary rash there, but part of the clue is a satellite colony is further away from the main rash. That's likely to be a um, a yeast. Um, to be aware of that. On the soles of the feet, that's not at all clear. But sometimes we can get little and tiny wee blisters around a circular edge. Often as those blisters dry, they can be quite brown. The roof of the blister can be quite brown, but, and that can look like a friction blister. Somebody may have been a squash player and may have had it for ages and ages. If you get a scalpel blade, it doesn't hurt at all. And lay it flat and take the roof of the blister off and send that to the laboratory. Forget about the fluid, which will be clear fluid, that won't grow anything, but the roof of the blister uh, will be packed with tinea. And if it is tinea, be packed with tinea. And um, so that's the allergic reaction underneath the tinea on the skin that brings the fluid and, and causes that. So just a trap, but a clue tends to be it's quite brownish dried blisters uh, that come. Um, this is a condition called pityriasis rosea. Uh, I shouldn't have said it so fast. Pityriasis rosea, which is a viral infection actually. And so we get all these um, uh, little weird dots all over, but there tends to be a, what's called a herald patch. One or two patches, looks like a tinea, one or two patches uh, that are a lot bigger. It goes of its own accord over, over uh, weeks to months, but it, it can be quite distressing for somebody, but look for, one or sometimes two or three herald patches much, much bigger than the rest can be the clue. Um, very quickly, nail disorders, they tend to be divided into two, either infections or not infections. Infections, tinea, yeast or bacteria. I'm just gonna rattle through some of those very quickly. Uh, here we have what's called a Bose line, B-E-A-U, French, Bose line. And we can tell maybe six months ago or so that person had some form of major medical event. So there's a horizontal line going over. It's like a line in a tree. You can tell a dry year, a bow's line points out to something that happened some time ago, major medical event. So whether it's nutritional or other. Um, these ones, there can be many forms of pitting, um, but the pitting can often be an eczema, nothing to do with infection at all. And this hair, for instance, can look, oh, it's a bit like tinea there, but it's pitting and it's quite feathery. And there's generally no sub debris there, no sub debris. And so that may well point to um, a, um, a, um, an, a psoriasis, I should say, a psoriasis in this case with no sub debris. And you see the pitting again, uh, that's psoriasis as well. And this is called oil drop, often called oil drop psoriasis. I'm just not sure what it is, but that's another form of psoriasis. There's many forms of psoriasis. This great toenail, sorry, it's not clear of the picture. This may be um, an infected um, ingrown toenail, but if it didn't get better, just don't forget to think of a malignancy as a possibility too, if it did not resolve and get better. Just <laughs> Uh, a trap for some people that's gone on for ages and just, just bear that in mind. 
this see the bows line there in the middle of the nail um uh, here we are see the bows line it's quite dark perhaps green that's likely to be a, a superimposed um uh, pseudomonas infection which is often green bacterial infection that's got on there here we find the avatinia and um, the ideal sample to get is I would like to cut, doesn't hurt at all, about one or two millimeters down here. We want to get as near as possible to the advancing edge. If you clip off here because you find nails revolting and put them in the pothole, the tinea there would have died some months ago. The active advancing edge is along here and down here. So ideally we want nails as near as possible to this advancing edge and or some of the debris underneath the nail, the subungal debris as it's called. And um, so when it's 10 ears of the nails, each nail has to catch it. So psoriasis, they tend to all get it at the same time. Not necessarily, but tend to, whereas 10 ears, one big toenail will get it, then another, then maybe the third toe, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't got time to spend on treatments, but topical will only work in nails if it's in 10, maybe 20% of the nail. Uh, there's orals, terbinafin and etraconazole, um, and there's lacquers, once again, lacquers by themselves are not very good, unless it's the end, uh, 10 to 20 percent, and using a, a urea avulsion with 40 percent can be useful um, to, um, uh, you put it on, may take a week or 10 days, keep putting the paste on, urea paste, and it just swells them out, and then use the oral. Under the microscope, you get a quick reply maybe a day or two from the laboratory. They're looking for these threads, these dark threads. It shows it's fungal hyphae. That's what they are, fungal hyphae. They grow in the laboratory, but there's millions of these different shapes and sizes. And under the microscope, they're identified by their spores. And there's five million different types of spores. So that's all I'm going to say on fungi. <laughs> um, then we look at this and wonder, think to yourself, any thoughts what that may be? Um, just thinking. And it happens to be very itchy. And when we look closer up, we may perhaps see that there. And there might only be one, there's another two, might be one or two of them only if you were to search the whole body, but the rash may be over the whole body. <laughs> and so this is scabies and it causes an allergic hypersensitivity reaction. So just these one, in this case two, may be enough to give a real itch all over. We can see it's tracked along here, that's its track, and the end of the track is where the mite is. Somewhere it's come here, and there's where the mite is. There may possibly be one there too. Um, so scabies, and there is a clara one of it. That's only, it takes about three to four magnification. And just to be sure, here we are here, just above the red line there, a little speck, but it started here. And over about 10 days, it's got all the way to there. And so either a clinical diagnosis, if you're sure that very, very few people that can nearly always find a scabies mite when it's there. There's very few, including dermatologists say they can only definitively find it less than half the time when it is there. Um, but very few people can, and it can cause utter chaos. Um, people have had cases of suicides um, and hospitalizations for six months with repeat heart surgeries and such like, thinking it was an allergy to the, it just goes on and on and on. There's been, it's, so it's not common except some areas, maybe in Northland, you can get staph aureus and or strep and can cause glomerulonephritis and such like, but very, very hard to diagnose if you've got, um, uh, if you've got um, staph aureus infections on top of it caused as well. Here's another you can see, I think the mate on the on the top left there, and or um, it's hard to see there. This is an older track, the mite may have left from there, but we can see where it was. So we get a bit of a clue from that. Um, and once again, I'm not going to spend time on that. And here you can just see it at the end there, maybe at the end of a track. Tricky to see. Here the beastie is, Sarcoptes scabie. And that's the mite, which is generally underneath. So they're only about a quarter of one millimeter in size. These, are, it's um, that's its poo, fancy name is Sibylla. So under the microscope, sometimes you'll see the poo and we're very, very allergic to the Sibylla. 
and the egg is about a quarter the size of the mite. There's a similar, uh, but the egg is about a quarter the size of the mite. They make us itchy all over. We generally think, oh, there must be thousands of them. On the whole, uh, we may only have between one and five or 10. There are one or two conditions where you get hundreds of thousands, <laughs> but generally only see um, very few numbers. And, um, but it only takes one to give an allergic reaction. When we get a mite, for a start, it's almost always from direct contact with somebody that happens to have it, whether they have symptoms or not, not everybody's allergic. And it crawls on the surface of our skin for three to four hours. So if you wash your hands, you touch somebody with scabies, wash your hands, it'll come off just like a quarter of a grain of sand. And but if you don't, it then goes under the skin and it's trapped under the skin for 10 days, no matter how much you wash. Lays its eggs underneath, not many of them are fertile, it only mates once in a lifetime. It comes up to the surface, moves about for three or four hours, and then goes under for another 10 days. So there you're not going to get rid of them by, by washing. <laughs> and here's a punch biopsy, this whole part here is the mite here, and a punch biopsy on the skin. Uh, then, and here's another one of the mite too. So it's thought um, Napoleon and his armies, um, of course there used to be no treatment for it. And uh, Napoleon often has got his hand on, on there because him and his armies and all armies would be itching all the time. Scabies was the norm. And so I guess if you fought bravely enough in battle, um, you'd die. So you finally got released from the itch. But um, I just say that because I remember in the British Museum years ago, it was a disgrace for a Viking to die of old age. It meant they weren't brave enough. So um, anyway, scabies was very common. So that's, um, I'm only four minutes over, which is remarkable. That's over. I do have, depending on how many hundreds of questions you have, I can very quickly show you some slides on honey, if you wished. I leave it up to you, Cathy, and your good judgment. Honey um, of, a, um, of a wound, if you like, post an excision. Um, a, um... the, the thing is, Ben, go for it. Do a quick, do us a quick thing on what you've got there, and then I'll try and just pick out a few of these questions. Eh? Okay, yep, yeah. I'll do this. This was somebody in her 60s who happened to be married to a retired GP and she had her head screwed on tight. She took a photo every day of her keratoacanthoma, which is there. And so she took a photo every day and um, don't know why, and she contacted me later. So day naught, it was excised, she had four stitches, but then she, the second day uh, onwards, um, next day onwards, she got extreme pain with the slightest movement of a leg. Um, there are the stitches four days after excision. She was given flu cloxacillin because it was really, really sore, plus vitamin C. Um, and six days post excision didn't seem to be getting any better, if anything, getting worse. Um, seven days, the stitches were removed. And the wound was dressed with Cadexma iodine, which is iodosol. Um, and she flushed it daily and it reapplied um, iodosol. She was told to keep taking the flucloxacil on. And then nine days later, she had finished the flucloxacil on. Um, and 10 days later, she went to the after hours. She's given more flucloxacil on. And it didn't seem to be helping at all. 11 days afterwards, we can see this redness coming around, not clearly defined. I just ask you to think what you think perhaps it could be at a long shot, just think what it could be. Um, and 12 days post-op, um, it looked perhaps even more marked. And I raised the, she then phoned me and sent me the pictures <laughs> and told me the whole story and out of the blue. And, um, so I said, this is a bit of a long shot. Rather than cellulitis, because it wasn't hot or anything, I just wonder about the possibility of an iodine sensitivity, just to think about. <laughs> you may mention that to the GP, which she did. And she said, what would you do? I said, this sounds wacky medicine, but I don't think it's infected. But we have to bear in mind it could be. Um, I don't think it's infected. You know, in the South Island, only 5% of MRSA, but it, it just doesn't seem like an infection as such. Personally, I would try Manuka honey. 
and she said, um, uh, what sort? And I said, well, a um, manuka honey costs the most, but it doesn't work that much better than ordinary honey. I'd try and use cold extracted ordinary honey. She said, I've got pots of money. I'll get manuka honey. So um, <laughs> she got the manuka honey and raised it with a GP because I said, listen, I don't like interfering and in what anyone else is saying. And so GP said, go with it. And so she used the manuka honey, honey under an occlusion. So that's three days post manuka honey, uh, five days post uh, manuka honey. And she put in writing to me because I, I never saw it. She just sent the picture, she said, I'm complete. Um, but I knew her husband when he was a GP, completely in awe at this remarkable healing. Um, and um, now has great, greater respect for little bees in the manuka bush. <laughs> um, I just thought it was a nice story. Sometimes um, these things learn, um, where are we here? Uh, 12 days post honey and 21 days, just better, 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 better. <laughs> Quite remarkable in a way, isn't it? I think it's just a solitary story. And so she sent me um, an email then uh, saying, well, you can read it. I'm not going to read it. It's, um, which is, is um, I think it was a very worthwhile, just don't dismiss these things as possible. We, we know lots of sugar, we used to preserve fruit with it in jazz. So heavy sugar kills bugs, but it's also a nice environment for regrowing tissue cells. And I think there may have been an iodine allergy tucked in there as well. Um, so um, um, it's lots of sugar, help preserve fruit, but when there's not much sugar, bugs grow like mad. And so we see that in diabetes where there's not much sugar, so bugs grow like mad. Or if we don't have enough sugar and preserved fruit, we have to have our sterilization process really clear instead. And so just uh, end up, so you've got something pretty to look at. Um, the, the remarkable story of the bees. So fire on ahead with your questions, please, now, Kathy. And I can take as many as you wish. I added a whole Fantastic. lot more slides was... in the novel. <laughs> that's meant, so much yeah, better so. than finishing with scabies, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. So you'll either be worried about being stung now. You might have nightmares, those kinds <laughs> of things. Oh. You've gone right up in my estimations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. All right. So I'm up to your knees now, am I? <laughs> so with folliculitis, does changing a person's razor help? Is it due to using a blunt razor? It can be whatever pulls the hair out. So can it be a blunt razor? Yes, that could be. A sharp one's less likely to pull the hair out so far. Um, I think a blunt one certainly wouldn't help because it may scratch the skin as well. Um, so I, um, yeah, I think um, if you use a sharp one, it still happens. Somehow try stopping for a while and putting hydrogen peroxide or something on instead until everything's really cleared up. And um, maybe you might have to use electric or something else, not so quite so close to the skin, um, but try and restore that normal microbiome for a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next. Right, how was mid-level provider defined? Do you know in the studies at the start, you said about who used antibiotics and which- I think they hadn't been through. Um, it was in the paper and it's a long time since I've read it. They're just not as experienced. And so the clinicians will be three or four on that, but further down the tree, it's every study does the same. The more clinical people we have, nurse practitioners, doctors and girls, the better, more patients are seen. But the more prescribers we have, the more antibiotics are used too. And the more newer prescribers, a lot more antibiotics are used. <laughs> um, so it's partially defensive medicine, all oh, frightened of if this goes, if there's a one in a thousand chance of it getting a lot worse, oh, am I gonna be hauled over the coals? Should you treat 999 to cover the one in a thousand, one in a hundred, one in fifty, one in ten? And after a while, people develop more confidence. Mm -hmm. All right. Someone was treated with Effudex, course finished, and now the lesion is not healing for about three months. Swab negative. Apart from getting wound specialist input, 
what wound treatment could be considered? What, uh, what was the treatment worth? Effudex. So that's what? normally for sort of cancerous lesions and precancerous lesions. Okay. And so what happened after that? It start, something started getting bad. Yeah. The, the, so they did the course of effudex and yeah. the lesion was not healing. So it's not healed for about three months. I see. All right. Um, and the swabs were negative. There's always one thing to think of if it's a wound as such is um, a small number of wounds that don't heal, maybe 1%. Are caused by an atypical microbe like mycobacterium one of these mycobacterium species so it can pay to uh dare I say it, punch biopsy which you don't have to do on a lesion like that uh, or perhaps if you get enough material ask for atypical mycobacteria but i don't think that would be likely in this case but it's always possible personally i would discuss with the clinician about something like using uh, honey in that sort of situation um, but it may be an ongoing hypersensitivity to that treatment. Um, and it's just stopping that hypersensitivity is stopping the, um, um, the, the tissue, oopsie daisy, uh, the tissue cells. It's funny, I couldn't get it to turn over slides before when I use that. Uh, from the tissue cells, um, um, re remending, if you like, um, uh, re epithelialization and such like. Okay. Could a tick bite in the far north of New Zealand possibly cause cellulitis and or Lyme disease? Uh, absolutely, definitely cellulitis, yes. Um, I don't know that we have Lyme disease. I just need to double check that, but I don't think we have Lyme disease in New Zealand uh, endogenously. Um, but I don't quote me on that. I, I don't think so, though. <laughs> but yes, definitely cellulitis would be possible, yes. And that's what happened with this friend of mine. She had a clear cut cellulitis. And it's just one of these remarkable stories because the time before I'd stayed there five years before, I'd saved a life for another medical event. <laughs> so I said, I, maybe I shouldn't come again because something seems to go wrong each time. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> In relation to your friend, though, someone has inquired if they got treated with doxycycline. If they'd got treated. Um, for cellulitis, um, there can be a number of treatments to think about. Um, and so um, tetracycline treats many microbes intracellularly, but she went on to, um, the clinician asked me, what do you think we should treat with? I said, I'll keep right out of this. Because <laughs> I know, I said, you've got a number of options. <laughs> and she said, I have. I say, you take your pick. And um, so she chose flu clocks and so on. And she said, you're happy with that? And I said, that's what I think will be appropriate. Uh, I'm not sure what your MRSA rates are here, but that would be appropriate as long as we can quickly slip on to something else. And that covered both the lines and the... Um, and the Staph aureus, if it was indeed Staph aureus, we'll never know. Incidentally, beta heme streps or group A strep or streptogenes, whatever you know it as, penicillin works better than flucloxacillin. Flucloxacillin will cover it. Uh, beta heme streps will be susceptible to flucloxacillin, but they'll be more susceptible to penicillin. So if you're really worried, it can pay to be thinking pen and flu clocks, for instance, if you think, oh, we can't risk another, another half day with this in case of, as a strain. I, I just mentioned that along the line. And similarly, occasionally, maybe 10% of the time, a staph aureus will be susceptible to penicillin, and penicillin can work very well, but 90% of them, 80 to 90% are resistant to penicillin. Yes, next. Right, so this, one, this one goes back to your nice rash at the start where you were talking about spa pools. And so this one's saying is, is the pseudomonas from the spa pool likely to be itchy? And are spa pools known to cause itchy rashes? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes. Uh, but people get really worried about, my God, what's this going on too? But it, but it can get, get itchy. And um, so it will go of its own accord. Um, as long as the sparkle was cleaned up. Uh, it's just always something to think about. 
when you get vast numbers growing at a nice, beautiful temperature, and there just happens to be skin cells or other things, enough nutrients in there to get vast numbers, um, then they, they find us even more nutritious. So it can, can happen. Try and stay away from systemic antibiotics if you can. We don't need it. Often topical. And something else I didn't, well, two things I'll just cover off there is um, sometimes, uh, and in children with infected eczemas and dermatitis, is taking something like Janola, actually, ideally, we use something that's not Janola bleach, um, but a cheaper one that doesn't have surfactants in it. But if I leave that to one side, if I, Janola, tends to have 5% concentrate bleach, uh, which is 50,000 parts per million each. Uh, I won't go into the details of it. Each 1% of bleach has um, uh, 10,000 10, parts per million of chlorine. So 5% has 50,000. If you do one in 1,000, so one mil of bleach and one liter of water, that 50,000 dilutes down to 50 parts per million. You must remember, one part of bleach <laughs> to, to one liter of water or half to 500 mils, etc. I'm always petrified. I only say to someone who I'm sure has got the head screwed on. And if that is used freshly over the body, swimming pool parts per million may be five to eight. So this is maybe 10 times stronger than swimming pool. It will kill all the staph aureus and such like on the skin. Sometimes that works for people. Incidentally, decolonization with chlorhexidine and such like uh, may initially seem to work if you repeat the swab after three to five days, but 50% of the MRSAs have regrown six months later. So um, actually the decolonization with rare exceptions tends not to work. I had one person once, as it happened in a rest home, who had had boils ongoing for eight years, had been treated with many different combinations of antibiotics, including rifampin and rifampicin and flufloxacillin and such like, and at one stage triple, and it would help a bit, but not that much. And she's just learning to put up with the boils. I said, this may be sound like wacky medicine also, and there's very little written on it, but I, what's your diet like? And said, normal. Well, everyone says normal, it's normal to them. I said, I would consider trying to have large, relatively large amount of cruciferous vegetables, um, like um, broccoli and, and cauliflower and such like, just try that for a while. And you came back 10 days later and said it's, it's the first time it's cleared up for eight years, um, completely cleared up. Just bear some of these mind, things in mind. One of the downsides, and we do have to do it sometime, of using really hitting it with antibiotics to get rid of it, is of course you damage your immune system. So it can be even harder to address the staph aureus if the antibiotic doesn't. Enough said, next. <laughs> Here I come. What advice do we give people with bed mites or flea bites apart from treating the pet? Okay, um, flea bites, it's a, it's a good question and it's not a simple answer. In general, there's no point with flea bombs because they do the ceilings, walls, curtains, everything else, and it won't be there. So in general, uh, if you know it's a pet, clearly make sure you've cleared it because sometimes the fleas can be resistant to the particular medication you use. Uh, then vacuum regularly, uh, so daily, especially around the bed, for instance, and pull the sheets back and do the beading, uh, vacuuming, and any beads in there, vacuum well underneath the sofa and such like. If you've got a dog, make sure it no longer sleeps up on the <laughs> on one the chairs. Uh, it's not allowed up and or keep it outside until you've cleared the house up. We're talking about reducing numbers over time because there can be eggs and such like too. You may or may not, if you have access to one, steam clean can help. Um, you can freeze sheets and or bedding. If you've got access to a freezer, you can put them into a hot dryer. If you've got access, they can go in there. So freezing or heat will kill them and vacuuming will reduce the numbers. Um, personally, if it's carpet there on the floor, the flea can go well down onto the carpet and re-emerge again later. So although normally I loathe chemicals, I consider getting a permethrin-based fly spray and 
going around just a few centimeters above the carpet. So it gets just off wet above the carpet and it leaves a little residue and permethrin came from chrysanthemums originally, just off wet and go over all the carpet. And then if a flea comes up, it will get caught by the permethrin. Sunlight will inactivate permethrin, well, ultraviolet light will. So if it has to go through the window, it'll be less fast uh, in activating it. But using a combination of that, I think, um, works if you keep at it. Bed bugs tend to be harder. They will go into three pin plugs where, you can see my hands, where uh, wallpaper joins, they can get under that. Uh, where there's a join on the bed, so it's a wooden bed ends they can hide in there. They can be extraordinarily hard to get rid of. Um, and they can live fleas in, bed bugs can live for months. Um, I happened to, I was talking to somebody in Auckland, a really good friend, well, she's north of Auckland, just last week, and she lives by herself. And um, a friend of hers was having a house built and, and it had been delayed and all rest. So I came to live with her for a few days. She had a dog, but she didn't bring the dog with her at all. She'd take it out for a walk. And she said, her house is full of damn fleas now because the owner must have had fleas. <laughs> and although the dog didn't come in, it came in with the owner. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, uh, they're tricky to get rid of. Um, it will have come from an animal. Occasionally, there can be cases where there's birds in a ceiling and if there's holes in the, in the ceiling, as in some of the older houses used to have that ceiling with little holes in it. I went into a rest home once that had um, itchy residents on the top floor and the second floor, but a lot more on the top floor. And when I look, looked at them clinically, I thought the bottom floor looks, the rash tends to look different to the top one. And it was actually two different things going on. There was scabies in the facility, and that scabies is relatively hard to pass on fast because most of the time the mites are just under the skin might only have one to five mites and they only spend three to four hours on the skin surface once every 10 days. So actually, contrary to popular belief, it's relatively hard. Um, but in the ceiling, there are lots and lots of birds and the bed mites are falling down. Uh, the bird mites were coming down. So somebody with caged birds may possibly have that too. And the little mites will bite us and go yuck and fall to the ground, but we get an allergy to that. So it tends to be around the belt line and or the arms again. Or they've come down the neck. And so we just cleaned up all the ceiling and treated that and all those bed mites and a whole lot of starling and such like up there, <laughs> all nesting. And they're all gone and no more bed, no more um, bird mite allergy as well as we got rid of the scabies. Yes, next. Oh, Mola, you're going to give us all nightmares. <laughs> Can over the counter <laughs> creams such as canistin treat fungal infections adequately? Can it treat it adequately? Yes, it can. If, just to be aware also, if we're talking, I should have read up on this more recently, if we're talking of, um, yes, they can. Um, you can, um, um, and fluconazole and such like, there can be resistant ones. If it's vaginal, it's ongoing, you can get antifungal susceptibilities done. Also consider if it's, um, um, uh, yeah, you can sometimes use, um, this is more for Gardnerella vaginalis, but you can use um, uh, white vinegar on a tampon and leave it in for five or 10 minutes to do that two or three times a week. So the number of ones, although that's acidic and yeast tends to like acidic conditions too. So it's normally more for Gardnerella, but yes, it can work. And we can get tiny numbers of a yeast causing an allergic type reaction too. So even a swab, if there's been yeast, they're still major itch, and the small numbers can be tiny numbers cause a hypersensitivity type reaction. Yes. Next. Yeah. Can pityriasis rosea be caused by medication containing progesterone? But I didn't quite hear all of that, please. Sorry. So, sorry, hold on a second. I've just got some background noise. <laughs> um, can <laughs> Pityriasis rosea be caused by medication containing progesterone? I'm not sure I can understand. Can psoriasis, did it say? Oh, the pityriasis. Oh, pityriasis, yes. So, yeah. Can pityriasis be caused by progesterone? Yeah. I'd have to say 
<clears throat> I'd have to say anything may predispose to this yeast, um, uh, Malassezia furfa, anything, and it may happen to be progesterone that starts setting it off, but it may be more important to take the progesterone or try a different one, but it's relatively easy to treat the pityriasis too. So you may be better to say, if it was a causal, um, causal situation rather than incidental, um, it's relatively easy just to put a cream on. For a start, you might do it three times a week, but after that, you might do it once every fortnight, just as a maintenance dose to it to wipe the yeast out. That would be my initial thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. All right, can dog ear mites be passed to humans? Also, suggestions, please, for painful orf lesions. Can peroral antivirals be useful? Uh, the orf, I'm not so sure of. I'm not sure that they are useful. And the first, uh, I'm not sure. Orf's a tricky one because it can be really, really sore. Um, but I'm not sure if uh, I need to have another look up, see if antivirals do work. I'd be surprised in a way if they do. And the first part of the question again was? Uh, it was about dog lesions. Sorry, I've deleted, I've moved it. Hold on, I'll bring it up again. Bear with me. <laughs> Jiggle when we're down onto the other side here. Can dog ear mites? Ah, dog ear mites. Can, yeah. can dog ear mites be passed to humans? On the whole, these mites are species specific. And so on the whole, they may well be able to be passed to humans, but I don't think they'll keep on and on going. So you may get an allergy from them because a bit like um, the bird mites, they go nip. And basically, they're not very comfortable. They don't like what they taste. So we can get allergies from them, but it will be unlikely to keep on going, will be my general thoughts on that. Thank you. Can any honey be used, any Manuka? The chemist sells special honey. <laughs> special price, too. Um, in general, <clears throat> as a proud Kiwi, uh, obviously, promote Manuka honey overseas and all these copyright issues with it. Um, <clears throat> As I said, with preserving fruit, sugar paste will, uh, strong sugar paste, microbes will not grow in it, strong sugar paste. Then you use honey, and honey in New Zealand is not adulterated by diluting it with water, as it tends to be overseas. So I just slipped that in too. So if we've got good New Zealand honey, then there comes another thing. In the extraction of honey from the hives, um, the honeycomb goes onto a swirler and it gets extracted. So you've got all uh, the wax and chunks in it and the honey in it. So it tends to get heated up to 70 degrees or whatever it is, like a pasteurization process and the wax goes to the top. But in the process of doing that, it bakes out a lot of the enzymes that can be beneficial. So um, ideally you would use cold extracted honey where the honey is, is cold because when it's heated and the wax is taken out, it's nice and um, clear. But then if you buy clear honey that hasn't been heated, it goes to really cause crystals fairly fast over two or three or four weeks, really hard. You can put it in a microwave, it'll remelt it again. But what they do, having extracted it and put in a big vat and the wax comes off the top, they put a little bit of creamed honey into it and which is tiny crystals and keep the petals going. And the rest of the clear honey copies those little crystals. So you have cream honey that can last on the shelf for many months before it goes hard. So I'll come back to explain that. Even sugar itself will be quite um, uh, inhibitory to microbes. Honey um, that's, that you normally buy can probably work quite well. It's seldom that you see um, cold extracted honey, but that will work slightly better because there's more hydrogen peroxides and there's a number of other uh, microbial inhibitors on there. The UMF honey will be slightly better still. I don't generally, I don't think it's worth the money for, for, for buying Manuka honey. I think just ordinary honey is likely to work best, but if you know someone at a farmer's market that you can get cold extracted honey, so much the better. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Sometimes after we switch a patient from IV antibiotics to oral, the cellulitis worsens again, redness and pain. And so then we switch the patient back to IVs. Is this common? Is there a particular causative bacteria which needs longer duration of IV antibiotics or is it just bad luck for the patient? I think it's bad luck in a way. Um, maybe um, they're not just Staph aureus or Streptococci that cause um, cellulitis. So there are a number of other much less common microbes. And as I said, the trouble is we can't normally grow it. Uh, so if it was something like Pseudomonas, then Fluploxacillin is never going to work. Um, so maybe either the IV wasn't long enough for the seriousness of that particular condition, or maybe the patient's um, immune system was down, may not have been long enough, or it may not have been quite as effective an antibiotic as it should have been for that particular microbe. Something, as I said, pen and Fluplox, um, strap and such like. Um, that would be my thoughts. Just something of interest, I'm going to slip in there, thinking of antibiotic resistance. Generally, the pressure is on for a number of reasons for IV to be stopped um, as soon as practically possible, once it's done its job, move over to oral. It should be up to the right concentration. So it's interesting it slipped back. We put the IV on because it gets high concentration very fast. Just as a little aside, most antibiotics are excreted by the kidney. So the IV will usually have less trouble on our gut microbiome than oral will. <laughs> I just put that in. So although there are some downsides to IV, one that's not talked of the upsides is that it can do less damage to our microbiome than oral. And that has a lot of other medium to long-term troubles if all our gut flora is knocked about too much. All right. I haven't given a definitive answer there, but I hope I've given enough um, ideas to think about. Mm -hmm. You've given information exactly for people to work on. Eh? Mm -hmm. Any tips for recurrent staph infections? So methicillin susceptible staph aureus that clears with flu clocks, but keeps getting crops, already moisturizes, uses Christoderm for early lesions. Okay. This is another, there's not a simple there's lots of publications and no clear consensus, no clear consensus, which probably implies there's no clear workable, something <laughs> that always works. In general, when we're children, for instance, we Staphylococcus aureus, there are a whole lot of different strains. And when we're children, we're more likely to get, I'll call them school sores. We're more likely to get Staphylococcus aureus boils. And because we are exposed to a different strain of Staphylococcus aureus that our immune system hasn't faced before. So you can use an antibiotic and well, it clears it up and you stop it and it comes back again. And so you use it again, it stops, it comes back. They can go on for six to nine months. Actually, it'll be the same whether you use an antibiotic or not. What you're waiting for is for that generally, it doesn't always, if it gets particularly bad, of course you have to do something. But what we're waiting for is that person's immunity to get on top of that particular strain of Staphylococcus aureus. And so because we shed hundreds of millions of them, even if you do eradication treatment and such like, the school friend's going to have it, the door handle's going to have it, others in the family are going to have it, it's going to be, we are, the car's going to have it that you sit in. And so generally over six to nine months, we'll get rid of that strain. Um, I slip in there and the advantage of antibiotics, it takes it down for a while, bounces back up, takes it down, bounces back up. Um, but that does damage to our microbiome, which we know more now and now has medium to long-term effects. It's just worth, I mean, cleanliness, obviously trying cleanliness, but that's clearly being done with Christocide and everything. Just worth, thinking about these cruciferous broccolis and cauliflower and just increase trying to increase that in the diet for some people i've seen clearly it makes a difference i'm not saying it usually does but it's an option to consider don't forget if you're using rifampicin um that can affect contraception contraceptive drugs and give red urine too just to warn people about that mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay, and so just a last one for you here. I often see spider bites. Starts as a blister, pretty white tail. Oh, my screen's just done a big jump. Hold on. So it's white tail that rapidly becomes an abscess with dark centers. Please, can you clarify if white tails are toxic? I think the answer is yes. Um, any spider with a venom, it's a range of toxicities and or different people will give a range of different immune responses. Now, maybe, as I said, around 8% of the time, there may be an infection sitting on top of that broken integrity skin, but most of the time it's an immune response and it can take a long time to come right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'll just squeeze in my, for some reason, my question and answers completely went offline, but it's come back on. Um, how effective is it to air out a wound rather than cover it to heal faster? Okay. This is really interesting. When we <clears throat> first started, we, the Royal We, when um, back in the late 1800s, when microbes were first grown, we could do something about them because once we grew them and once we realized they cause infections, we realized you could put on different chemicals that would kill, kill them. Things like um, mercury, dare I say, or <laughs> vinegar or any of these other things or then um, essential oils and such like. Um, we could put on which would kill them. And we also realized that drying microbes in a petri dish on a wood kills kills the microbes too. They cannot dry, cannot grow in the dry. So intuitively that seems correct. Then we started learning much later, much, much later. Yes, we don't only want to get rid of the bugs, but we do not want to get rid of the re-epithelialization process, which is key to the healing. So there's a balance, put that up so everyone can see, there's a balance of we need the moisture for the re-epithelialization process to go ahead, but we don't want so many microbes that it's an infection too. If we dry the wound, then the microbes may die, but the wound's not going to heal. So in general now, we need moisture for the wound to heal. And that's why something like honey can help. We've got the moisture from the honey that it's got hydrogen peroxide and various other flavonoids and, and such like in there that are antimicrobial. The hydrogen peroxide also kills anaerobes and such like, but it's rough moisture and it does not kill any of the fibroblasts or the re-epithelialization process in the wound. So generally we need moist wound healing as the quickest and the sooner we can heal that wound, the quicker we put paid to the microbes that are there. In actual fact, we need some microbes generally to trigger off the healing process too. That's, that's an interesting process. Um, often topical, if required, and I'm big if on that, and just mentioning the cadexamide, and I showed before cadexamide uh, is a lot less toxic um, to the re epithelialization process, but it may dry out the wound too much. And or we can get, some people can get an allergy with iodines, but just being aware of some of those different things in general, moist healing and heal as quickly as possible. Good irrigation will get rid of some of the wind. Sometimes topical antisepsis is required, but only if it is quiet. And because we know heavy colonization is a heavy staph aureus in a wound is not necessarily an infection at all, just like heavy staph aureus up your nose is not necessarily an infection at all. If it's healing, stick with it, whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Ben. Well, I'm going to stop there because you've done a lot of talking and you've got <laughs> a huge amount of information and I'm very grateful for your time. People have said about it, it's been super interesting. Thing. Thank you. It's well <laughs> entertaining, a huge wealth of knowledge brought to the floor, and I've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed your presentation this evening. So, thank you very, very much for your time and for everyone who's joined us on the journey tonight. Thank you.